Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease medications. Okay, right. Uh, so we are in the process of discussing the actual neurodegenerative process that occurs in Alzheimer's disease, which is marked by these two cardinal features, the amyloid plaques and then the neurofibrillary tangles. Now we've discussed how the amyloid plaques form. Okay, we've discussed that they result because of this um, bad pathway for breaking down the amyloid precursor protein, which results in the production of uh, amyloid beta peptides, both the amyloid beta 40 and the amyloid beta 42, which can aggregate into these amyloid plaques. Now, we know that the appearance of amyloid plaques seems to correlate to the death of the cells, okay? Uh, however, we do not fundamentally know whether it is the amyloid plaques which are toxic, or whether it is the free amyloid beta monomers themselves that are toxic, okay? But something about this all seems to be toxic to neurons. In addition, what we're now going to look at is how the amyloid plaques seem to trigger the formation of the neurofibrillary tangles. We're now going to discuss what is known about the neurofibrillary tangles. Now, it is thought that the formation of the neurofibrillary tangles is secondary to the formation of the amyloid plaques. Okay, right. So let's now talk then about neurofibrillary tangles. Okay, or NFTs for short. Right, so neurofibrillary tangles are going to occur uh, because of a protein known as the tau protein. Now the tau protein is usually associated with microtubules. Okay, now I'm going to give you a, a little bit of background information about microtubules. Okay, so specifically microtubules in neurons. Okay, so if we draw a neuron here, I'll squish it in here. Okay, here are the dendrites of the neuron. So these are the dendrites here. Okay, coming off the cell body, and then you've got the axon here, which is the much longer uh, process that comes off the neuron, okay, with an axon terminal right at the end. Now, all sorts of things are transported from the cell body of the neuron to the axon terminal. Okay, now how does this work? Well, basically, you have these tube structures that run in the axon. Okay, I'm trying to show one now. I'll colour it in so that I, it, I can show it more effectively. So there is a tube structure, many tube structures running from the cell body to the axon terminal. Okay, and these serve effectively as tracks. Okay, effectively little roads inside the cell. And you can set transportation processes off and they can follow the track from the cell body to the axon terminal and then we can deliver things from the cell body here to the axon terminal. Now these little tracks, which are little tubes, uh, are known as microtubules. Okay, so let me show you the structure of a microtubule. Okay, now it is a hollow tube, but I want to emphasize that things are transported on the outside of the microtubule. They don't get transported down the middle of the microtubule. Okay, so basically microtubules are made up from little structures known as tubulin dimers. Okay, so we'll let this be a tubulin dimer. Let me just split it into two since it's a dimer, a two-membered structure. Okay, and the two proteins that make up the tubulin dimer are alpha tubulin, okay, here, and then also beta tubulin here, okay? So you put an alpha tubulin together with a beta tubulin and that makes tubulin dimer. So here in orange, this is the alpha tubulin, okay? And here in turquoise, this is the beta tubulin here. Okay, now, out of these tubulin dimers, you are going to build a microtubule, okay? So let me show you how you do this. So you start off with a single tubulin dimer here, okay, and then you'll add another one on. Now it doesn't just go next to the one there, okay. What's going to happen is these are going to spiral in an alpha helical way, okay. So it will be slightly further along than that one previously. Then you'll have another one down here, 
Okay, which again will be slightly further along. And maybe I'm doing these a little bit too far along. Okay, because what's going to happen is it's going to spiral round, and then by the time you get to the other side, okay, you have got back to this position, is the idea, at least anyway. Okay, so if I draw another picture of this, a better picture of this, the microtubule is going to look like this. It's going to be made up of these tubulin dimers that sort of spiral round. Okay, in an alpha helical way, so a spring-like way, but instead of having gaps between the different portions of the spring, so if I draw a spring here, here it is, this is what a spring would generally look like, okay, but of course, between the bits of metal, you've got gaps here. Imagine compressing the spring completely up, okay, so you push it right in so that there are no longer any gaps between the metal. That's effectively what you're forming with a microtubule, okay, and now the pieces of metal of the spring are instead replaced by loads of little tubulin dimers basically so if we were to zoom in you, this is what you'd have loads of little tubulin dimers here and then you've compressed it right down so that this is what you've now got okay here are the tubulin dimers here's another layer of tubulin dimers here okay so if I color this in here are the orange alpha tubulins okay here and then there's another layer of them here, and it will go on and on, okay? And then uh, here are the layer of beta tubulins. Okay, now, how many, then, tubulin dimers do you need to go round in a full circle? Okay, what's well, 13? So if I was to draw a picture where we cut through a cross-section of the microtubule, this is what it would look like. Okay, it's hollow inside, and then there will be 13 of these tubulin dimers all the way around. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, so 13 of the tubulin dimers are needed to go round an entire time in this great alpha helix. Okay, so that's the structure then of microtubules. Now, bound to the outside of microtubules, you're going to have these little proteins known as tau proteins, okay? So they're all over the place, basically. Okay, and they um, help to stabilize the microtubules. So here in purple, here are tau proteins. Okay, right. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, what seems to happen is that these tau proteins that are attached to the microtubules within the axons of these neurons end up getting hyperphosphorylated. Okay, so they get loads of phosphate groups added onto them. Okay, so let me draw this here. So here's a phosphate group, here's a phosphate group, here's a phosphate group. Okay, now when the uh, tau proteins get hyperphosphorylated in this way, what happens is they dissociate from the microtubule, okay? They no longer bind to the microtubule, okay? So imagine now all of the tau proteins falling off the microtubule. Now, what ends up happening is once the tau proteins have all fallen off the microtubule, the microtubule then starts to disintegrate. It starts to break apart back into the separate tubulin dimers, okay? So you're going to lose your microtubules between the cell body and the axon terminal. Okay. In addition, it gets worse, the phosphorylated tau proteins, or the hyperphosphorylated tau proteins, are going to aggregate into filaments. Okay, so let me get another piece of paper and I'll show you this. Okay, the principle is very similar for the amyloid beta um, um, peptides, but not quite, well, it's not go we're not going to have uh, those um, beta hairpins this time. Okay. Um, what's going to happen is the hyperphosphorylated tau proteins, which we'll show here, here is our tau protein with these phosphate groups attached to it, so this is our hyperphosphorylated tau proteins, are going to form filaments, okay, so they're going to bind to one another, okay, so here is another hypophosphorylated tau protein, here's another hyperphosphorylated tau protein, and it will go on you will form massive great filaments of hyperphosphorylated tau proteins. I'll put the phosphate groups on here to illustrate that they are all hyperphosphorylated. Okay, right. Uh, and then what's going to happen is these filaments that you've formed here now are then going to form these paired helical filaments. So basically, now what's going to happen is that these filaments are going to form an alpha helix, so this is an alpha helix just spaced out, it's a spring structure here, and then you're going to intertwine this with another one of these alpha helices, okay, 
um, which is also one of these filaments that's been formed from phosphorylated tau proteins. So let's just colour this in. So these are all um, phosphorylated tau proteins here. Here is the tau protein in purple. And then we've got the phosphate groups attached onto each of the tau proteins, and I'll colour those in, in blue here. So here they are. OK, right. And then uh, you're going to form these paired helical filaments in this way, as shown here. So this, then, is what's known as a paired helical filament. OK, so not only uh, does the hyperphosphorylation of the tau protein cause the dissociation of the tau protein from the microtubule, which then leads to the microtubule disintegrating, okay, which is going to disturb transportation from the cell body to the axon terminal, but also the hyperphosphorylated tau proteins uh, f aggregate into these filaments, which then form these paired helical filaments, which are known as PHFs. And these are what are going to form the neurofibrillary tangles in the cell bodies and dendrites of neurons. Okay, so if I show a neuron here, okay, remember one of the other characteristic features of Alzheimer's disease, okay, the histological features, is that not only do you have the extracellular amyloid plaques, but you also have the neurofibrillary tangles, which are inside neurons. Okay, so if this is a neuron that is somehow still alive in this amyloid disease, sorry, this Alzheimer's disease affected brain section, okay? Inside it, what you're going to have is these neurofibrillary tangles which are formed from these paired helical filaments. So there's one paired helical filament, here's another paired helical filament, here's another paired helical filament, and remember these filaments have been formed from uh, the aggregates of the tau protein, and they form tangles inside the cell bodies and also the dendrites of the neurons, okay? And this is the formation then of the neurofibrillary tangles, the NFTs. Okay, so how does this all relate to the amyloid uh, plaques then? Well, it's believed that this initial step where you go from having normal tau proteins to having hyperphosphorylated tau proteins, that this is triggered by the presence of the amyloid plaques, okay, or maybe by the presence of the amyloid beta peptide monomers, okay, so something about the amyloid plaques then triggers misfunction of the tau protein inside the neurons, and the tau protein ends up getting hyperphosphorylated, it falls off the microtubules, the microtubules then disintegrate, which compromises axonal transport, okay, within the neurons, and then the tau proteins aggregate together to to form these filaments, okay, and then the filaments form these paired helical filaments, which then form the neurofibrillary tangles that are seen within neurons. Okay, and after these neurons with neurofibrillary tangles within them die, then the neurofibrillary tangle is left afterwards as a tombstone uh, to the neuron, okay, and that's how you can end up with extracellular neurofibrillary tangles. Okay, right, so that then is the story of how you get these two key histological features of Alzheimer's disease. The next thing to discuss is how do these two key features of Alzheimer's disease actually kill neurons? Well, there the story is very incomplete. The answer is we don't actually know how amyloid plaques or neurofibrillary tangles kill neurons. Certainly, the problems with the tau proteins is going to lead to problems with axonal transport that could kill the neuron, maybe, okay, but we don't fundamentally know what causes the neuronal death. We're going to get a hint, a further hint later on when we discuss the anti, uh, well, the Alzheimer's disease medication, uh, memantine, okay, because that seems to slow down the rate of neurodegeneration, and we'll see how it works later on. Okay, but fundamentally we don't know why the amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles kill neurons. So at the moment, all we've got then is the formation of these amyloid plaques leads to the formation of the neurofibrillary tangles, and then the amyloid plaques, along with the neurofibrillary tangles, 
okay, and potentially also along with the uh, amyloid beta peptide monomers, which are often written A beta 40, and then you'll put slash 42 to mean one of these two, either amyloid beta 40 or amyloid beta 42, okay, these three things are somehow going to cause neuronal death. Okay, and that's what underlies uh, the neurodegeneration seen in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, right. So, before we now move on to the Alzheimer's disease medications, the one thing I want to talk about before that is how do we diagnose Alzheimer's disease? Okay, so to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, there are two main ways that you can do it. Okay, so now I'm going to mention diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So, Either you can use an MRI scan, okay? So you can do an MRI scan of the brain, and what can you look for? Well, what was the key feature of Alzheimer's disease? One of the features that we spent so long talking about, okay? The enlarged ventricles. So what you can do is you can do an MRI scan, and you can just look for uh, enlarged ventricles, okay? Which would be indicative of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so that's one of the ways that you can uh, diagnose Alzheimer's disease, but there is a more interesting way that you can diagnose Alzheimer's disease using PET scans. Okay, now PET stands for positron emission tomography. Okay, and we're going to use a very special chemical that's going to uh, release positrons, okay, and which is going to bind to amyloid beta peptides. Okay, so I'll tell you about this chemical in a moment. So, positron emission tomography. Okay, right. So, this is what you do. Firstly, uh, you give the patient a chemical known as Pittsburgh Compound B. Okay. There are other chemicals that do the same thing as Pittsburgh Compound B, but Pittsburgh Compound B was the first one developed that did this. Okay, and this compound is going to bind to amyloid beta peptides within the patient's body. Okay, so it will bind to amyloid beta peptides, either amyloid beta 40 or 42. So it will accumulate where there are amyloid plaques within the brain, basically. Okay, and then what does Pittsburgh compound B do? Well, it releases positrons. Okay, so let me just make sure everyone knows what a positron is. So a positron, a positron rather, is the uh, antimatter particle for an electron. Okay, so it has a positive charge. Okay, and basically when a positron meets an electron, and there are electrons all over the place, okay, they annihilate one another. Okay, so here is the matter particle, the electron, and here is the positron, the antimatter particle. And when these two meet each other, when they bang into one another, a phenomenon known as annihilation occurs. Annihilation. Okay, Anni uh, oh, how do you spell this? Annihilation. I think you need an I there. Annihilation. Um, okay, I think that, no, actually, I get rid of that I there. Annihilation. I think that's how you spell annihilation. Okay, so you get uh, positron electron annihilation, matter antimatter annihilation. And what is released? is a high energy electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so you get gamma rays released. Okay, and what you can then do is you can uh, put the person in a detector which will detect gamma rays. Okay, and from the two gamma rays that have been emitted, if we detect those two gamma rays, because you emit one in both directions here, okay, you can then ascertain roughly where uh, the annihilation occurred, and therefore where the positron was positioned, and positrons don't get far. Basically, what will happen is the Pittsburgh compound B will release positrons, and then the positron will collide with an electron very, very quickly. Okay, so it won't move far away from where it was first produced, and then uh, you'll get the gamma rays being produced from there, and by detecting the gamma rays, which are extremely inert, so they will definitely go through the rest of the patient and off to the detector without being disturbed. Uh, we can then ascertain where the positrons were being emitted from, and therefore where the Pittsburgh compound B has ended up, and that will be indicative of where the amyloid beta peptides are. So that's one of the ways that you can now diagnose Alzheimer's disease quite effectively. 
Okay, so, it, we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video what we'll do is turn our attention to Alzheimer's disease medication, starting with the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and then moving on to memantine.